because I don't remember. Are we supposed to record to the cloud? Oh no, Erica's got it. You know what? I'm just gonna cloud's gonna be better because then I can get it um to the folks who need to put it up. All right, let's go ahead and get started, everyone. I'll stop sharing. Um, I just want to welcome you all. Good afternoon. Welcome to the very first Pedagogy Innovation and Technology Stop of the semester. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Erica Offerdahl. I'm a professor of biochemistry in Pullman um, in the School of Molecular Biosciences. And um, my other hat is the director of the Transformational Change Initiative. And thank you all for joining. My name is Brian Malone. Um, I work for uh, Academic Outreach and Innovation. I'm on the instructional design team, and I'm also our faculty liaison. Uh, I am housed on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. I'm available in Spark 102. So if you ever feel like coming by to uh, talk about teaching, I'm here. So before we get started, I just wanted to give you a little background or an overview of what pit stops are. Um, these are new this semester. It's a new series, and we're hoping that um, if faculty and other instructional staff enjoy them, that we can continue them in years going forward. Um, but these are twice monthly opportunities for members of the teaching community to get together to discuss, um, reflect on, and share insights about emerging technologies or instructional innovations or to collaborate to solve immediate pedagogical challenges. Um, each month, we've selected a theme. And what you'll notice is that there's two events. Um, the first one is designed as a system-wide event where we bring folks together and broadcast via Zoom. And then that system-wide event is followed a couple weeks later by a campus-specific local event. And with, with this particular structure, we're really aspiring to gain shared understanding across the WSU community, um, to cross-pollinate ideas and promising practices, but also provide time for people to work closely with one another, collaborate with colleagues on their own campus so that we can think about the unique needs of our student populations that vary from location to location. Um, you can see already that the pit stop um, is a collaborative effort. We're trying to leverage the expertise of instructional designers and faculty so that we can advance teaching excellence. And so what you'll notice throughout all of these pit stops is that we've invited um, members of the instructional design teams through learning innovations and AOI, as well as experts from the WSU Teaching Academy. Um, and, and other expertise through the Transformational Change Initiative. So we're really hoping that this will be a great opportunity for us to get together in a more regular, um, more regular schedule. Um, with that, I think I'm gonna turn it over to Brian, who's gonna be our lead facilitator today. So today we are uh, going to uh, move through a, a series of, we've got uh, five panelists, uh, we're going to start things off with um, Professor David Macon, who's going to um, kind of introduce us to chat GPT and kind of contextualize this conversation for us. Then we'll have the rest of the speakers introduce themselves. I have one question that all of the panel, I'll ask all of the panelists to answer. And um, once we get through that, that stage, uh, we're going to open this up. Oh, I had a request to speak up. Um, Chris, can you tell me if this is better? Yeah, it is. When you move back, you kind of go up and down in volume, but thank you. Okay, thank you for letting me know. Um, so uh, yeah, we'll have David Macon kick us off and contextualize this conversation. I will have each of the panelists introduce themselves. I have one question for all of the panelists. And once we've heard their answers, we will open this up for Q&A. Um, we're going to ask everybody to um, post their questions in the Q&A option. Um, and then at the end, Erica will uh, kind of filter those questions and, and we'll get to as many as we can. And then, of course, whatever questions we can't answer, we will be able to 
um, invite you all to the, the pit stop conversations in a couple of weeks and we can continue the conversation then. Um, so with that, I will turn things over to um, Professor David Megan to kick us off. Well, thank you. I'm very excited to, to be here and of course, probably be able to talk about chat GPT. I figured, you know, many of you probably have read about the technology or you've talked about it in conversations with friends and colleagues and particularly students. I thought it might be helpful uh, to kind of do a demonstration and let, as opposed to me telling you what chat GPT is, why not let the technology describe itself? Uh, so what I did is um, I had a conversation with chat GPT uh, this morning. And so, uh, you know, very basic. I won't read all of this. I'll just kind of the questions here. So I asked, you know, this morning, I said, morning, GPT. And I will say, you will see a thread where I'm very polite in my conversations uh, so that eventually, if it is an overlord, it knows that I was very polite. So it's benevolent. Uh, so morning, GPT, how would you describe yourself to an audience of professors? That's who you all are, right? So, you know, and it gives a very straightforward answer. Um, it's actually pretty reflective of what, you know, those that, of us that are in the tech field, uh, this is a really good answer in terms of, uh, you know, what it does, how it was made, how it can be used, and it's tailored to the audience. But that wasn't enough. I wanted to go, well, I really want you all to get excited. So my question was, this is wonderful, again, being very polite. And <laughs> could you enhance the paragraph by adding, you know, words to make them more excited. Again, it remembers who's the audience and I want you all to get more excited and says, of course, let me do that. And it goes through and it enhances itself and it adds more details. And I said, well, you know, all right, again, got to thank GPT. So thanks GPT. Uh, could you create a tweet? So now I'm asking it to take material that it has built for a specific audience enhanced to get the excitement. And then I said, actually, I want you to completely change um, what the writing is for. So it means it has to know the parameters for a tweet, what makes a good tweet, and include the hashtags. I love those hashtags, artificial intelligence, <laughs> language modeling. But then I wanted to have a little bit more. Again, great tweet. I feel like I want to contribute to the trained data and now tell it that it is, that's a great tweet. What would you say to those who are concerned about you? Um, and as it took a little bit longer, and I think that has to do with the fact there was lots of people using it. There are millions of people using this. Um, but what it built was, interestingly enough, I went back and I, I teach an honors course where we talk about AI and other technologies. Um, and I went back to my slides, and this is almost near to what exactly point for point what I would say um, in terms of how we have to be mindful of the tools that we create, how we create ethical kind of frameworks that guide. And fundamentally, this is a tool. So it comes down to how we use it, how we build in kind of frameworks for precaution and really guide and structure the use of the given technology. And so this is just a, a demonstration that I thought it would be helpful um, we had a video, it took a little bit longer than this, but it's how this technology is able to not just create material, kind of text and knowledge and what it's able to pull from, but the, the, the complexity of transforming that information by enhancing it, changing the modality to a text, as well as being able to pull through and build out information uh, we can certainly talk about the limitations of this, uh, but I hope this is a, a quick introduction um, to really what this tool is, how it can be used, and certainly some of the parameters around why we need to be mindful uh, of the technology and how to leverage it as a tool to enhance what we do. You know, stop sharing. Thank you, David. So, oh, I'm um... sorry. No, there's one more screen. I forgot. Okay. One more. So then I said, that's very helpful. Um, and then so I had just forgot the one more question was, what are your limitations? So is it aware of the limitations of itself? And it put together a incredibly detailed overview of the limitations, which is not just a summary of what um, you know, you're seeing commonly written, 
I worked with this for a while and kept adding more and saying, well, tell me more about this in more detail. And it did it. And it was fairly accurate. Um, and so I will end on that note. That was the final slide. Thanks, David. Um, so I wanted to invite our speakers today to introduce themselves. And I'll just kind of go in the order that people are uh, spotlighted on my screen. Um, uh, if we could go uh, David, D, Heather, Kate, and then Brian, just a brief introduction of your role at the uh, institution um, and particularly your uh, research and experience with um, with AI or and chat GPT. So uh, David Megan, I'm an associate professor in the Department of Criminal Justice and Criminology, College of Arts and Sciences. I'm also the director of the Complex Social Interactions Lab. And so we analyze body-worn camera footage. Uh, we we're working on software to automate the analysis and detection. So that's my involvement with machine learning and AI. Uh, and my area of expertise is primarily technology and its um, influence on organizational practices. Um, so that's kind of the long and the short of it. Uh, my name is Dee Posey. I'm a faculty in psychology. I'm also the associate chair uh, for undergraduate education for the psych department, and I'm a member of the Academic Integrity Hearing Board. Um, my interactions with ChatGPT uh, this semester, first, I'm teaching a writing in the major course, and so that's factored um, into my design of my course and, and how it's will use it in that class. Um, and while I have not heard any cases um, in academic integrity uh, about chat GPT, I'm fairly certain they're in the pipeline. So that's kind of how I have interacted and will interact with um, chat GPT this semester. Hello, my name is Heather Schneider. I'm an instructional designer with AOI and Global Campus. So as part of that role, I work with faculty members to design and develop Global Campus courses, as well as working with um, courses uh, with faculty on campus-based courses to design learning activities and integrate educational technologies into courses. So right now our team has just been working to kind of stay up on the latest information and discourse surrounding AI technologies, chat GPT, and others that may be coming. So um, there's a lot of discussion and discourse in our field right now and what this, what the best um, pedagogical practices are going to be in this new era for AI writing tools. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Kate Watts. I'm an associate professor um, and the interim director of composition in the English department here in Pullman. Uh, my areas of expertise are writing and um, writing instruction, um, and most of my job responsibilities are either teaching writing or teaching teachers to teach writing. So I both supervise TAs and faculty members who are often new to teaching and the teaching of writing, and then I also teach courses to pre-service English teachers who will then teach high school students and middle school students to write. Um, so in those roles, I've been asked a lot about chat. GPT and similar technology, um, specifically, right, as connected to courses that maybe focus on writing or have a lot of writing as components of coursework. And really, until December, I had what I would say very limited experience with AI um, or chat GPT. And so I started asking it questions and started trying to learn as much about it as I could. Hello, uh, my name is Brian Clowers. I'm an associate professor of chemistry, and my research primarily focuses on, um, you know, a collection of very large data sets. And so I've had some experience with machine learning in the past, and I also teach a class related to um, coding and, um, yeah, I say data analysis in chemistry. And so my primary interest in this technology has been how we might be able to augment some graduate education courses and kind of streamline the integration of different disciplines into, you know, what I'd say, you know, 
uh, you know, historically complex problems. And I think that, you know, providing students with a way to, to grasp some of those things pretty easily could be quite interesting. I'm also interested in this from a more service-oriented perspective to the broader research community. And, you know, what is this going to mean for publishing, peer review, and things of that nature? And I think those are all topics worthy of discussion. Uh, thanks, everybody. So we have one question for each of the panelists to answer, as I mentioned earlier, um, and then we will uh, turn it over for, for Q&A. And in the q and I'd invite people to direct their question to everybody and anybody on the panel or a specific speaker. Um, my one question for everybody, which I'll put in the chat, is what opportunities and concerns does chat GPT raise for you in your discipline? Um, I'm going to post that in the chat and we'll go in a particular order here. Um, we'll, we'll, I'm going to invite um, the speakers in this order. We'll have Brian, D, Kate, David, and then Heather. Um, Brian, feel free to gather your thoughts. Don't feel like you have to start speaking immediately. <laughs> no, I made a few notes and I think that. Uh... You know, um, yeah, as you know, as Kate mentioned, you know, this thing is three months old, and I think that's kind of the breadth of experience that we have with Chat GPT in particular. But I think when we try to take a larger view, you know, there surely will be other technologies that are very similar. I think, um, in terms of the opportunities, as I mentioned, teaching a class with respect to coding, I oftentimes would spend, um, you know, the first, you know, four to five weeks trying to teach students about the syntax of a particular programming language before we can actually start to use that. And I was actually been quite impressed with the capacity of ChatGPT to generate code, you know, using human language that you put in as the prompt and then provide functional code. Now, with that said, there are oftentimes errors associated with that code, um, but this also provides an opportunity for students to get straight to the debugging component, which is integral to, you know, trying to develop something functional. Um, so, um, as I mentioned, you know, I kind of see this system as uh, one that has a, you know, as David's slides indicated, had a, you know, loose relationship with the truth. It's a predictive algorithm, but in, in many ways, given the large body of text that it was trained on, it can provide uh, reasonably sounding answers. And uh, I think that's where some of the problems surely start to uh, crop up, is that we as, uh, you know, it's a domain level experts, you know, we have um, perhaps the knowledge to identify some of the, the false components of an answer, but um, I think that this is one of the challenges that we need to help assist our students in being able to have that knowledge as well. Um, in terms of my concerns, you know, I think I'll put aside the societal ones, but in terms of like discipline specific things, I see that, uh, you know, it has this very broad knowledge base that it can draw from, but the depth at which it can provide sometimes is a little bit shallow. Um, but as David also mentioned, as you start to refine some of the prompts that you provided, it can start to change those things and make them a little bit more, um, you know, I'd say intelligent sounding. And I use that uh, that term specifically. Um, some of my concerns, of course, um, are related to the fact that, you know, how do we ensure that people are getting the correct information as it's not necessarily connected to any kind of fact checking mechanism? I'm interested in uh, what it's going to mean from an equity perspective, especially from the students. And then, um, you know, I think it, it also, we have a, a collective conversation that needs to occur with respect to uh, expectations of faculty. You know, if we have to start having more personalized assignments and, uh, you know, assessments, that's going to put a large burden on our faculty. And so how are we going to address that? So with that, I will stop and uh, let somebody else talk. Well, I will um, speak from my experience um, so far, which hasn't been much, um, but I can say that as far as opportunities are concerned, I think this offers us the opportunity to really think about our courses, what we teach, how we assess learning. Um, and I'll, I'll admit that uh, this semester, admittedly in a panic, um, I revised my writing in the major course uh, to include, in fact, uh, the use of ChatGPT. So, um, and, and as a result, I have approached the class 
slightly differently. I've, I've come in, if you will, sort of on a higher level, a higher expectation for my students, because, you know, if chat GPT can do some of the work for them and kind of as, as Brian mentioned, um, you know, some of the work is done. There's the sort of surface level, um, ability for ChatGPT to write a paper. And so my students need to know more than just that surface level to be able to evaluate the uh, products of, of ChatGPT. Um, so I see that as an opportunity. I think my biggest concern is detection of um, AI generated text. I, I'm, if, if you've played around at all with um, ChatGPT or any of the detection apps, um, it's pretty clear that uh, they're not terribly reliable. Uh, I'll give you an example. I um, took a passage written by ChatGPT, put the same passage into three different uh, detection apps. One identified it correctly as being AI generated. One uh, identified it as human generated. And the other one said it was sort of human generated. It was 76% chance that it was uh, created by a human. Um, and so, you know, when you're putting in the AI generated text and you're getting those different answers, that's concerning. But I wanted to look at the possibility of false positives. So I put my own work into these detection apps and uh, on, on occasion, it would actually correctly identified as human generated writing, but it also identified it as um, AI generated writing. So um, that's a concern to me. It's a concern um, for those who are looking to detect um, AI generated work. Uh, it also concerns me from an academic integrity uh, point of view. Thanks, Dee. Um, so initially, I was I was pretty concerned about ChatGPT. I'll I'll just be honest for a moment. Um, I was first alerted uh, about ChatGTP by colleagues in secondary education, and um, when when it first came on my radar, they were in kind of existential crisis, and I quickly spiraled with them um, because uh, in writing studies we think of writing as thinking, and it's a particular kind of critical thinking. Um, that is refined and honed and explored in ways that are unique when we commit words to the page. Um, there's something about having to actually write it on the page, whether you're typing it or you're jotting it down, um, that, that forces you to come up with the right words to describe something or to explain something. And so in that absolute existential crisis, we were all sort of panicking together. Well, if students aren't writing, if something else is writing for them, what happens to thinking? And if thinking is important, what happens, right? Like you can picture this spiral pretty quickly. Um, and for me as a writing teacher, a lot of my pedagogy is tied to writing as, as an argumentation specifically as, as a democratic process. So then right now it's, it's really spiraling. So I thought I better get busy and play with this thing because there isn't a lot of research or information out there, at least in, in, you know, in November and December. So I tried it. I gave it writing prompts. I gave it prompts from my classes, prompts I sort of imagined on the fly. Um, I asked it uh, uh, to revise. I asked it to tweak. We had back and forth. Um, like David, I'm very polite with all technology and AI, just in case. So, you know, hey, chat GPT, could you, um, could you do this, please? Could you try this out? So I asked it all kinds of things. I asked it to provide a summary and response of a New York Times article, then of a published scholarly work. I asked it to do a feminist analysis of the Powerpuff Girls. I asked it to do all kinds of things, and sometimes not academic things. I said, hey, ChatGPT, I'm thinking about taking a trip to Banff. Can you make an itinerary for me? Um, the results varied widely. Even after I prompted um, revisions, I asked it to think about different audiences or mediums. I asked it to add sources. I asked it to add specific kinds of sources or evidence. Um, and again, those results were, I, I was surprised by the range of results. So um, I think right now I'm really seeing it as, as prompt design is gonna be more important than ever. So kind of piggybacking on what people have already said. 
And we'll need to think carefully about the writing tasks and the requirements that are associated with those writing tasks. Um, chat GPT writes well when asked to do things like define, list, recognize, report, classify. It doesn't do so well when it's asked to create, apply, weigh, formulate, design. So, you know, I'm kind of already thinking Bloom's taxonomy. Bottom of the pyramid, it's great. High order on the pyramid. Um, it tries. It definitely tries. But even with tweaking it, it struggles. Um, so I'm really right now seeing it as a tool for writing. Like, I'm not interested in, in fighting students over it. I don't think that that's going to be productive. Um, technology is meant to be a tool. So let's figure out how to use it. Um, so I really kind of went back to the writing that it produced and tried to put, you know, my, my writing teacher hat on. Um, it generates pretty formulaic responses, five paragraph essays or modifications thereof, um, right definition or background, two or three points, um, a conclusion, right, a very tried and true kind of approach to writing. I'd call it the bare bones of, of classical argument. It writes cleanly in that it writes pretty grammatically correct. Um, but I would say that grammatically correct is white middle class American grammar leaning pretty masculine, um, which is something to talk about in itself. Um, so the more I read those responses, the more I saw what it generated as brainstorming, early outlines, jumping off places for research, for critical thinking, a tool that would help writers get started. Um, I'm kind of thinking of it right now the way I think of Wikipedia. It's a great place to start, but if it's where a student, a writer, a researcher ends, um, then we have a real, right, a limited response. Um, so I'm kind of thinking about it also, thinking about Ds, thinking about plagiarism and where it might fall there. Um, plagiarism comes in many forms, right? The copy and paste version from the internet is, is obvious. It's easy to prove. Um, I don't necessarily want to play like detective with it. So um, I think I'm going to have to lean in a lot to the scaffolding I was already doing that helps prevent the other kinds of plagiarism that aren't the op obvious copy and paste. So things like um, early proposals, annotated bibs, progress reports, conferences, reflections. In writing studies, we've leaned on those a long time, both to keep students on track and have multiple um, checkpoints, um, but also to curb Right, that I grabbed my friend's essay and submitted it and pretended it was mine. It, it kind of, right, because it's you're not going to find a friend's essay who meets all of the scaffolded work. Um, so I'd say right now my big takeaways are try it, see what it does, ask it the kinds of questions you ask students, ask it the kinds of prompts you give, ask it stuff that is part of your job that you work with, see see what it's able to do, um, and then ask a question: How could it be used as a tool? And then my final thought is, I think really talking with students, right? How can we use it as a tool and what role might it play um, in assisting us to do the work that we need to do? Oh, that's a lot of really good point. I think the, not recap all that's been said, I think that we, we are at a kind of a, it's not a crisis point, right? It's a tool. Right. But it's a tool that when you don't have clear guidelines around its use, uh, it's uncertain, right? Uncertainty underlies all technology. We don't know what's going to happen. And I think that when we're there, we kind of fill the vacuum, the void of we don't know, and it can be scary, right? Equally so, right? Like you look at this, you you play around with it, and you realize, wow, there's so much. But to Brian's point, I mean, I've been able to put code in and ask it and give it wrong code and it fixes it. And I go, wow, that is, that's right. It should be that way. That's the way the syntax should be. And so I look at this and I treat it like, like how we cite that it's a tool. So how do we figure out a way to integrate and enhance what we do? Um, there have been a lot of really thoughtful conversations that have been on this. Um, and I think that's where I would encourage all of us to look at, well, how can we integrate this into what we do to enhance student learning, student engagement? To Dee's point, maybe even to make it equitable, right? We have students who might struggle, um, and even Kate point, and some of that, some of Bloom's lower levels, they might need assistance. And ChatBT is now the equalizer to say, you need to be at the high level. Well, let's use some assistive technology to get you there and to do it in a way that you have guidance from faculty, 
right? And, you know, staff support to really help get you where you need to be. I'd much rather frame our conversation, our efforts around integrating a tool to enhance versus, and we do, we need to identify the people that will be malicious and we'll use it in that way. Um, but that has been the case for all technology, right? So that's where I've been trying to, to focus my, kind of my efforts in recognizing that it exists. And I'm confident that we can modify our practices, think creatively around how could this enhance what I do so that I can have those more applied activities that say, I need you to demonstrate that you know how to do X, Y, and Z. And chat GPT could actually enhance my ability to grade those in a much more, right? Like there's, I know there's got to be a way. And there's a lot of really bright people here at this university who can come together to do that. And so I appreciate these types of initiatives and certainly the TCI and the teaching academy, because those are the conversations that we need to have around. We've all been saying we need more applied activities. We've all been saying we need something that's more than just writing. Um, I was pretty fortunate to have some funds out of the provost office, I believe two years ago, there was a, a grant program to try to create alternative to writing assignments. And my pitch was let's create educational videos, right? 15 minute videos and to do them in teams. And we did a pilot in a class of like 175 students all in teams of 10. Didn't go as well as I thought it would because teams of 10 are really difficult to manage. Um, but then refined it in my honors class. I did it again in the honors course and they just got better and better in creating these educational segments. And so I started talking to students around, well, what if we had used ChatGP to enhance what you do? And they said, well, we would have gotten to this milestone so much quicker and we would have had the time to be able to do these things we never got to. And I hadn't even thought like, could I let them do that? How would I do that? Would be the parameters? Is it skipping steps and that they need along the way? Because I hadn't thought about it. So I guess to, to not recap all the points, I really encourage us to think of it as a tool, recognize that there are concerns about it, but this could very well be, it's not the panacea to it, right? It's, it's a technology, a tool that we should be able to adapt and integrate into different aspects of our jobs. Um, the code has got me really excited because I've even given it challenging things that I struggled with. I'm like, I don't know how to get this to work. And I was like, have you tried this? And I was like, no, I haven't. It didn't work, but at least it gave me a suggestion. So it's a brainstorming app too, if you will. Um, but I'm just really uh, appreciative of being able to have everyone here. And I'm excited to get to the, to the questions and the conversations. And I know that uh, Heather is up next. Thanks, David. So many great things have already been said. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start in with challenges first. I think one that comes to mind is, you know, there's a tendency from the design community to want to jump in and start designing based on what we already know about the tool, right? And this tool is evolving and it's probably evolving pretty quickly. So, you know, there's a tendency to want to say, okay, we know it can do X, Y, and Z. So let's design around this, um, especially when it comes to academic integrity. And that might be changing and evolving pretty quickly. So that's that's definitely a challenge is designing for what the needs are now while keeping in mind that this tool is going to keep evolving. Um, and then I have been hearing some concerns about privacy, potentially just something for instructors to keep in mind if they're using this with students, depending on what you're asking them to, to put in there, just acknowledging to students that it's not necessarily anonymous or private, you know, that the information's going in there. Depending on the prompt, that, that could be totally fine. But something instructors might want to be aware of. Um, there is the aspect of bias in the technology, which I think has been mentioned already. You know, it's training on things that have bias in them, right? Us and, and materials that we've put out there. So, Something, again, it's just being transparent with students about that. Um, and then Brian already mentioned equity. And I think that's going to be a big one, especially if ChatGPT does become paid or have paid tiers. You know, some students may have access to a free version and others may have access to, to more. And so those are just things to think about sort of down the line. 
Um, in terms of opportunities, I can say there's, you know, a lot of excitement and curiosity in the design community about what the potential opportunities are here. So many that have been said, like David mentioned, opportunities to, to give students some more personalized help, you know, differentiating assignments, providing feedback, personalizing learning, things that can take faculty a long time. Potentially, this could really be a tool to help with that. Um, and I completely agree. I right now in my experimentation, I see it really as a brainstorming partner and like helping at specific steps during a task. And I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, and then just generally, I see this as a good opportunity to ensure that our assessments are really authentic and that they're aligned to our learning outcomes that we want students to demonstrate. I think it's always just going back to, you know, if you're thinking about using this in your classroom or you're you're worried about students, you know, using it on one of your assignments, just thinking about what are the outcomes I want for my students in this course and, you know, where does this fit into that? Um, so I think there are a lot of opportunities here and just approaching it with sort of a sense of curiosity and, and seeing, you know, what the opportunities are. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, I see one question in the Q&A from um, Paul. And then Paul, I also saw that you had asked a question about, um, so Paul, I saw that you asked, you have two questions. One is, does chat GPT remember an individual's questions and conversation? Are there privacy issues when we ask students to use the tool, especially with uh, personal information? Um, Brian started to answer that. He said chat GPT does remember your questions that you submit, and you can even continue conversations later. Um, Paul, your second question was, Kate mentioned that there uh, was perhaps a bias in the writing. Um, how would that ripple into the, uh, uh, into uh, being a useful writing aid to diverse population of students? Um, I think I wanna invite, um, I'll ask Brian first, you want to speak further to your, your initial answer there. Um, chat GPT does remember your questions that you submit and you can continue conversations later. Um, is there more you'd like to say about that? Um, yeah, I think I would, I would say um, just a few things on it. So, you know, there surely is the privacy component. Um, I think that's, um, you know, for the same reason that, um, you know, there's a concern for sending something to chat GPT, there's the same thing for, you know, putting in that same question into Google, right? These things are still recorded. So, um, yes, I think there is some concerns there. As for it being remembered, I think there's actually some utility in that as well. So, um, you know, if you sign up for an account, there's actually like kind of like a menu bar on the side that has your conversations that you've had with it in the past. And um, as the tool is refined, it's been interesting for me, at least, to revisit some of those conversations, especially with anything related to arithmetic or math. And they've tried to improve those capabilities. Um, they're generally pretty terrible, but um, it's been interesting to see it evolve so I can ask it to recalculate something. But yes, you can revisit them. Um, you know, and I think that, you know, when we start to think about a tool for brainstorming, if you find more information, it, that could also be useful. Um, yeah, so I think I'll stop on that topic there. Thanks. And then, um, Kate, I thought I might invite you to uh, start speaking to that um, that second question. You mentioned there was a bias in writing. Um, could that uh, become useful? So, Paul, please correct me if I'm um, mis mi misparaphrasing your question. <laughs> if I'm not paraphrasing your question well, but um, you're asking about how would this uh, kind of turn into a useful writing aid to a diverse population of students? I think um, if, if that's the question about how might it be an aid, you know, kind of back, back to what David was saying, if, if something is particularly challenging to a student in the early parts of a project or of a task, it, it, it could be a wonderful aid. Um, I'm thinking about some questions I gave it that are often really challenging for say English 100 or English 101 students. And it provided starting places in an order or a structure that actually could become then a longer response. And so I think in that way, um, it becomes a, an equalizer in that a student who already sort of just knew where to start or had good training in where to start or had more experience with tools that help you get started, um, it, it equalizes there. Um, I think anybody who might 
you know, get a question tossed out to them and goes, ah, that's a big question. I'm not sure where to begin. I, that, that was kind of um, my thinking on that front. Um, I, David can probably speak to this better. I have concerns about its ability um, with research though, um, as much as it tosses out good starting places. So if you ask it to add citations, it, it offers, I think at like a 100 level, um, the people you would hope students would go read, if that makes sense. But it doesn't necessarily catch everything that you'd sort of hope in a research journey students would catch. So um, I, I tossed out a, a question. I asked it about um, a critical race theory reading of something. What oh, happened, Brian? Oh, I, I was just going to echo um, Kate or my experience with um, with references and Kate's. Um, you know, I mentioned briefly that you know, and a and David's slide said this as well that it's you know ChatGPT is not connected to the internet and it doesn't it it has no relationship to the truth right um, and at least in some of the technical disciplines um, uh, what I've seen is that some of the uh, the references are entirely fictitious they are predicted they may have the names of the people that you are familiar with if you're deep into the field, but the actual titles of the papers or the journal articles are entirely fiction. So um, yes, that can be problematic. That's sort of what came up in the, the, the prompt I gave it where I asked it to do a, a critical race theory reading of a particular television show. And it tossed out the names of several critical race theorists. In fact, somewhere, right, it pulled information about some of the earliest critical race theorists, and it knew to put those names in. Um, the citations it made and the quotations it made, I'm like, I'm not sure that person said that. They definitely didn't say it in whatever text you made up. And um, that's not a very useful thing to have quoted or paraphrased from that particular scholar. Again, it kind of reverted back to things like definitions. And I'm like, I'm not even sure that's how that person defines it. Um, I worry though, on, on the side where I, I worry maybe more about um, its language abilities because it understands um, English and the rules that govern English. And I'm talking now more about grammar, the way that it does. Um, it kind of seems to have an understanding of English grammar as a monolith of American standard English. I'm talking here about specifically edited um, academic English, which is its own thing. And I, I worry about setting that up as an expectation students think that they should achieve, that they should abandon their own voice, their own English, their own dialects, their own words to achieve that. Um, and I worry too about what it sets up for us as readers of English um, and what we expect grammatically from students. So I'm, I'm as an English teacher, I, I don't even have grammar on my rubrics or my grading things. I care about content. I care about thinking. And I don't want students to get hung up in a semicolon or something else in grappling with a concept. So I have become worried about the expectation it sets there, if that makes sense. And I worry about then the impact on all of us as we start to think of it as an expectation or the way it perpetuates that kind of myth of standard American English as, as, a, as a, a goal, if that makes sense. I hope I answered your question, Paul. Um, would any of the uh would would david or d or heather like to speak to any of these points we do have um another question so if uh please feel free to share your thoughts or i can move on to the next question oh, just real quick on the bias i think it's it, it is an important part and it's, it has built in bias it's trained on us but it's right they don't tell us we don't have all the sources that it pulls from right? it pulls from the internet a variety of sources on the internet um and, and it's important i mean you think about um you all might remember years ago, I mean, wow, like five, six years ago, right? The, the chat bot, you know, Twitter taught Microsoft's bot to be racist in less than 24 hours. And it was like, wow. Um, Cause I mean, it, it, again, it's trained on us, right? But, and so the way in which we speak, what we, we highlight as being important, the ways in which we sequence words together. Um, I think that one of the things that I've always, and I was, again, we're just, talking about this and we're seeing more people it's like it lacks emotion right which is weird right like how do you read <laughs> how do i how do i tell if a paper has emotion in it but it is it's sterile i mean i have used this for if they were charging me i'd have a bill by now i've been really having fun with it 
Um, but it, it is, it's like it, it reads without emotion, right? And kind of what it is to, to be us, right? Um, and there is this sense of, well, how do you do that? And I've been trying to figure like, well, I want you to add in more of this and sound more like, and you keep doing it and go, it gets better and better. And then there's that, when we talk about like the concerns for the, the question, Brian, you put out like, there it is. Like when you can't distinguish it from us, then what makes us us, right? And I think that's where the critical thinking, it's where what we teach people and why we teach them matters and then convincing them as well that fundamentally you're here for this reason. This is what we're trying to teach you and to give you those skills. This is just a tool to help enhance that. Um, but yeah, if you have not, I would really encourage you. Uh, it's free for right now. Uh, so spend some time with it. Um, yeah, <laughs> so thank you. So David, that, that point I think leads really well into this um, comment that we received from Lisa. Um, if you ask chat GPT, if using it as a form of plagiarism, it does not deny that that is the case. I'm having trouble as my course is an M course. My prompts when entered come up with a C minus or a C level paper, excuse me, except when you ask it to be smarter and you can continue along the be smarter path. I'm not sure what to do as you can ask it to write outlines in addition. Many of my questions are apply or critically evaluate. So if I'm parsing that, that question correctly, um, I think this gets back to a couple points we've addressed. The concept of plagiarism, but also I think it was Kate, you were talking about those higher order um, Bloom, Bloom's taxonomy levels. Um, so I think, and David, you were saying there's there's challenges, or there's concerns and opportunities. The fact that we can ask it to keep refining and become smarter and alter its answers. The fact that we can morph it, you know, you showed us earlier, you took a statement and then asked it to embellish and promote itself a little bit then you asked it to convert what it said into a tweet so we can push it further and further um i'm 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 wondering if anybody wanted to to dive in on that comment from from lisa because i think it i think it uh, continues the conversation that we've started a little bit uh, i don't i don't mind uh addressing lisa's statement um and unfortunately lisa i'm not sure i have the the answer, the answer. Um, but, you know, when I think about writing in the major courses, um, you know, these are um, low enro enrollment courses. And as you know, Lisa, in um, psych, we have gigantic classes. So a writing in the major classes is very different from our usual lecture-based classes because it's, um, it's smaller. Um, it offers the opportunity for one more one-on-one -on -one interaction between students and faculty. And so as I think about chat GPT and writing in the major course, I think about things as Kate had mentioned about like scaffold, scaffolded assignments. You know, if you're working with students one-on-one -on -one, um, and you know, it's a scaffolded project or uh, assignments, my hope is that working, students working with a professor would render chat GPT irrelevant because you know why ask chat gpt when you're working with directly with your your faculty member so i'm not sure that that really addresses your concern um but you know when i think about the use of chat gpt in a writing in the major course that doesn't concern me as much as say using chat gpt um in a you know or a hundred person class with uh you know writing assignment at the end of the semester and you know the use of of or the the attraction to chat gpt to write that paper at the very end when of course you're overwhelmed with you know grading and can you really scrutinize each paper to you know try to determine if it's uh written by ai so um i i would just say that for writing in the major courses i think there are ways around it I see Heather has her hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to build on what you said, Dee, because I think there's a really important point you made in there, which is sort of when students are going to be interested or tempted to use this. And so, you know, Lisa, in your comment, you mentioned you're already having sort of apply and evaluate level questions. 
which is a really good thing. And I think a deterrent here, even though chat GPT can do it, I think an instance where a student is going to go jump to chat GPT or Google for, for that sake is, you know, if you get a question, explain the theory of X. Okay, I can go to chat GPT or Google really easy for that. But if you've already asked them, now apply that to this thing that's of interest to you or, you know, in your future field or a local, you know, you ask them to make that connection to something that they're, the reason they came to this class and something they're interested in. There's the initial thought might be not be, let me go look this up. The initial thought might be, hmm, how does this, you know, connect? And so it's sort of thinking, I'm sort of interested in thinking about when will students actually be going there? And so we might be designing for those issues that yes, ChatGPT can answer it, but will students actually be going there for that? Some of them probably will, but I'd be curious, you know, to know, is that going to be the first reaction or not? Oh yeah, go ahead, Brian. So in terms of kind of uh, assessment, you know, I know historically I've done this and it's pretty common in our discipline is to use multiple choice questions to, to uh, you know, kind of look at a student's factual knowledge. And, um, and those are, you know, not always, but uh, chat GPT does a reasonable job at identifying the answer, especially if the attractive distractors are pretty silly. Right. And so um, I think it's just a cautionary tale if we start to think about relying on that form of assessment um, and take home exams, you can certainly expect students to use that as a tool to answer the question. So I think we've got time for another question, maybe two. Um, I'd like to invite anybody in the audience that has a question to to direct that question to the whole panel or somebody specifically. I'll also throw in a reminder, in a couple of weeks, we will have the chance to meet um, at your respective campuses to continue this conversation further. And I believe audience members are able to unmute. Um, oh, we just got one from uh, Daniel. Um, with respect to integrating chat GPT into the learning process, I wonder how easy it is to trace the claims its responses simulate to bona fide knowledge sources. First, do I assume correctly that one should not trust it to communicate accurately about its sources? Second, do you have any recommendations about how students can be taught to use other tools to critically evaluate its output? Okay, I'll, I'll 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 jump in. Um, my I don't have a, a final answer for you in any way. It's a very trust and verify kind of thing, but uh, I would not. Um, I don't think it's going to communicate correctly about the sources. Um, it's a predictive algorithm. It doesn't necessarily have that that attribution from you know this this is the you know a, a piece of technical knowledge. Um, it's not going to accurately attribute that to uh, its source material because it's just trying to predict what it's seen in the past. Um, so, uh, you know, and I think as to how to teach students to verify those things, I think it really requires, you know, in some ways what we've always kind of asked students to do is to, you know, look for more than one source, right? And I think that you need to yeah, kind of follow through on that. So I know that's kind of, kind of a, not maybe super helpful, but that's the way I think about it. I'm reminded of an assignment that many of our teachers do in our 200 level writing course in which the students um, select usually from a bank provided by their instructors, um, an article. Um, and it's usually from a nonfiction book, like a chapter from um, a book about education or something in the social sciences and the students are tasked with finding the sources and reading the sources and thinking about how the writer paraphrases quotes draws upon the sources where they use the sources why they use the sources how well the job they do documenting them thinking about them in terms of argument and how they're used it's usually a really illuminating assignment for students. They find both um, things that they want to emulate, that they want to try in their own writing, and things that they end up 
maybe not being so fond of. We found some kind of ethical dilemmas in, in plenty of published work through that, that route. And I, I think you could do something similar here. Um, I think you would probably find more faulty things, but even if you could track down right the a little bit of the trail of how it ended up in um, the AI's knowledge bank, um, I, I think it could be a really interesting journey um, to think about that and think then about knowledge making and how knowledge making happens in a particular field or um, a, within a particular group of people, et cetera, et cetera. I think there's something really good about that. <laughs> Yeah, I said real, real quick, I mean, we've all been doing this, right, for decades, right? So I remember um, one of my favorite courses here at WSU was the advanced survey methodology with Don Dillman. And he provided uh, activity that had things that were correct in it and things that were horribly wrong in it. And he said, find them and tell me why. And I've always felt how important that is, is you could do the same thing with chat GPT is, you know, you, so I asked it a question, we were just messing around in the discipline and said, you know, what are the core tenets of routine activities theory? What are the strengths and weaknesses? And I had them all fairly, I said, but what are the critiques of it? And I thought, what if I just gave that to students and told them, all right, I need you to tell me <laughs> what is right and what is wrong about this and substantiate that. I've tried it, you know, I've, it gets close, but it doesn't do the same. And I think that's still where the learning is, is we figure out what are the skills? What do we need to, what are we trying to do here? And then where it kind of fits in. But I just recall, I mean, we didn't have chat GPT and Dillman just made this activity because he knew that's the best way to, to learn and to practice. Um, and I still recall that was one of my favorite activities that I, I ever did in my doctoral program because it, it made, it, it was the application of knowledge, right? Like you couldn't Google it, <laughs> you had to see it and know it. Um, I still think that that's what we can do and we know what works. We just gotta figure out how to let the tools kind of just find their way to enhance what we do. Um, I would like to invite any last minute comments from anybody on the panel before I um, turn this over to Erica for any closing remarks as we are coming up on the uh, top of the hour. I saw some other comments coming in and one other question. And unfortunately, I think we have to wrap this up. But yeah. um, but thank you all. Uh, thank you to the panelists and thank you to everybody for coming. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Erica to, uh, to to end things here today. Yeah, a giant thank you to everyone. And this is the beginning of a lot of discussions we can have about emerging issues um, that instructors are going to face in the classroom. In two weeks, there will be campus-specific activities. You can check the TCI website to see the details about those. You also have some folks on your campus that are, that are my contacts about the pit stops, and, and you can feel free to reach out to them. And um, this recording will be posted. So if you have colleagues who are sad that they missed out, um, you can direct them there. Um, thanks again and have a great week, everyone. Thanks.